On a dark, stormy night in Transylvania, a British solicitor is travelling along a treacherous road on a horse-drawn carriage to eventually arrive at a large, gothic castle. This castle is owned by an eccentric but alluring Count. Welcome to my home. At first, the Count seems charming, erudite, but there's also something unnerving about him. Why is he only awake at night? Why does he seem to cast no reflection in the mirror? And why does he appear to have a frighteningly animalistic thirst for blood? The Vampire is one of the most prolific and well-known monsters in horror. Ask anybody of any age, any generation, and they'll probably be able to describe a vampire. A creature of the night. Someone who appears human, but feeds on human blood. We all know the rules of the vampire. They can't enter your home without an invitation. They don't like garlic, or crucifixes, or holy water. The vampire has become so saturated in popular culture that it doesn't just belong to the horror genre. One bat, two bats, three, three fabulous flyers! Uh, uh, uh. It could be argued that the vampire is the original movie monster, the thing that started it all. Listen to them, children of the night. What music they make. And unlike a brain-dead zombie or a silent slasher killer, the vampire can be alluring, charismatic, even attractive. Can you at least tell me your name? Angel. Angel. It's a pretty name. But how exactly did the vampire become one of the most mainstream and commercially successful horror icons of all? I'm flesh and blood, but not human. I haven't been human for 200 years. This series, we're going to be looking at the history and the evolution of one of cinema's oldest monsters. We'll begin by deep diving into the novel that started it all, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and its various adaptations, from Universal... I am Dracula. ...to Hammer... I am Dracula, and I welcome you to my house. ...to Francis Ford Coppola. I am Dracula. We'll then be looking at the way the vampire movie has changed and evolved from decade to decade. From the erotic art house vampires of the 60s and 70s. I've seen many a night fall away into an even more endless night. Nights like last night. To black exploitation. Blackula. Blackula. To the mainstream teen vampires of the 80s. Michael! Over here to the romantic vampires of the 90s. The old world, Louis. They called it the dark gift that I gave it to you. Finally, we'll be looking at what's become of the vampire in the 21st century. I like to hang out with other vampires. And I like to company. Awaken! Awakey, wakey! And we'll ponder the question, in a world of Twilight movies and what we do in the shadows, Will vampires ever be scary again? <laughs> Join me as we begin our journey through the evolution of the vampire. We're back! Welcome to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike Munzer, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. At this point in the podcast, we've already had seven whole seasons. We began with the evolution of slashers, then we moved to ghosts, then folk horror, then zombie movies, then occult horror, then mind and body horror, then aliens. Now, this series, it's the eighth series of the podcast, and we are finally covering, as that intro suggested, 
the most famous monster of them all, the vampire. Uh, we've got some incredible movies to cover over the next 20 or so weeks. Uh, and this week, as ever, is just going to work as a little introduction. So we are going to be bringing you a brief history of the vampire, the origins of the vampire, uh, and we're going to be running through some of the titles that we are going to be covering uh, this series. But this episode, as with all of our intros, will be completely spoiler free. Later on in this episode, I'll be joined by psychoanalyst and cinephile Mary Wilde. But first of all, it's time to sit down and chat with the walking and talking encyclopedia of film and television. Uh, This is always one of my absolute favourite conversations to have at the beginning of each series. Welcome back to the podcast, Kevin Lyons. Hello, Kev. Hello. Hello. Good to be back again. Yes, and talking about one of my favourite subjects, (gasps) vampires. I know, right? It's been a long time coming, I think, and I always love discussing this kind of stuff with you it feels like an exciting you know first day of a new school term whenever i sit down and chat oh, to you, Kev. Bless you. <laughs> that's so it, it, it's it's the result of a misspent childhood basically you know and when i should have been reading the classics i was reading you know horror comics basically but uh, i love it and it feels like we've all been kind of living a bit like a, a a reclusive vampire in an old transylvanian castle for the last two years you know not stepping outside into the daylight just <laughs> yes yes have we how, how very fitting yeah i like it yes. <laughs> we're all a bit vitamin d deficient and everything else so you know um so tell me let me start off by asking you your own we'll get into the history of the monster in, in a moment um, but first of all Kev just for you generally personally are you a fan of vampires in horror and, and how far back does your interest in vampire movies go yeah and of course you know it, it, vampires absolutely adore them they were everywhere in popular culture in the 1970s now that I think of it you know when I look back you know I, I was born in the 60s but you know my formative years really for this sort of thing were in the 70s and you know you could even you could even I've just remembered you could even get a, a Count Dracula ice cream. Oh my god, amazing! <laughs> I know it was, they were vampires were just everywhere, and part of this I think was down to um, Marvel comics. Oh god, bloody everything is down to Marvel. They, comics. Everything is down to Marvel, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? But this case, it, it, personally, yes, it was because they they had a um, in the states they had a, a comic called the Tomb of Dracula. Oh yes. And this was, you know, one of their typical full colour monthly editions where Blade came from, of course, you know, which we've seen in the films. And Morbius, I think, is mixed in there with it as well, certainly. But they reissued them, they reprinted them in Britain as as a weekly comic called Dracula Lives. Came out at the same time as another weekly title, Planet of the Apes. Right. Adapted the films and then went off onto its own thing. And these were, you know, these were the greatest works of literature I'd ever seen at that time. They were amazing. Every week rushing off to get them. There was always in the in the Dracula comic, there was all, you know, like a Frankenstein strip as well and a werewolf <laughs> by night and all the rest of it. It was right up my street. And, you know, they had this, this Dracula that was modelled on um, Jack Palance when he played the Count. Yeah. And... He's, you know, he's this sort of weird character in, in this. He kind of lurks a lot of the time on the very edges of our world. Mm. Later on, he gets subsumed into our world and there's lots, you know, chasing around and, you know, a lot of action stuff. But when we first meet him, he's kind of exists just on the edge of our world. He's kind of this mythical creature that lives up there in the castle and occasionally comes down, swoops down on the town and preys on the blood of virgins. And um, actually, when I say praise on the blood of virgins, we need some reverb on that, if oh, you don't mind. We do. you know, I was almost yeah. going to ask you to put on your Transylvanian accent for this conversation. I shall play, uh, pray on the blood of virgins. <laughs> virgins' <laughs> blood. I'm, the, I'm not an actor. Perfect. I'm not an actor. It's a very good effort. It was a very good effort. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a great, I mean, and and I'm sure we'll get into this as we go, but what a great monster, what a great creature, what a malleable idea for a monster too, right? Absolutely. You know, Mm. I'm I'm not a stickler. I know a lot of people are, particularly when they're old farts like me, but I'm I'm not. I'm not a stickler for for sticking to the rules of vampirism. Yeah. You know, vampires are made up. They're from mythology, and the mythology was never the same. Well, that's it. You know, they can be whatever different storytellers want them to be, can't they? Um, Which leads me nicely, Kev, into my sort of first main question for you, which is what, what is a vampire, and what are the origins, I suppose, of the vampire? You know, basically, they are these sort of undead creature Mm -hmm. who preys on human beings they're a parasite yes they're a revolting parasite traditionally seen in mythology as bloated 
and ruddy of skin because mm. you know they they were full of blood just like you see a leech mm-hmm. you know when it's been feeding that mm-hmm. that's how they were portrayed and they go right back the babylonians and the syrians had them they had a, a creature called lily too which became lilith in hebrew mythology which then became part of the adam and eve myth in the bible so there we have you know vampires right at the start of the bible wow um yeah i mean they are everywhere in, in greco-roman mythology there were creatures called ampusa mm-hmm. that were said to drink blood and in the novel of dracula which we're going to talk about in a little while mm. there's a ship that brings dracula to britain called the demeter in the first film version of dracula nosferatu the name of the ship is changed to ampusa so clearly they knew a little bit about the, the, the Greco-Roman mythology. Yes. And that in. They turn up everywhere. And every culture has a slightly different take on the vampire. Mm-hmm. You know, we go on now, oh, no, you know, they can't walk around in daylight. Yeah, they can because they could in some of the mythologies, uh-huh. you know. And yeah, no, they can't change into wolves. Yes, they can because in some of the mythologies they could do that as well, yeah. you know. So every, the, the, the same basic part of the of the myth exists this idea that they drink our blood but the actual details have changed over and over and over and over again until we reach our modern mythology wow which is you know film television comics and books and yeah we're still changing the mythology and i don't particularly have a problem with that i have to say i think it keeps the the genre alive a little bit well there is something very i think just innately unnerving to us about a creature that wants to drink our blood right i mean even if you think of creatures real creatures whether they're leeches or mosquitoes or whatever but just this idea of something latching onto you and drinking our blood it's something that's that should not happen right in our heads that's the thing of course not i mean you know with ghosts we kind of think oh look it's a ghost we're scary but with vampire and with 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 zombies and you know vampires are a kind of zombie aren't they they're back from the dead you know zombies eat our flesh and vampires drink our blood and Mm. just the idea that we are someone's food yes is really disturbing it's there's something really nasty about that idea that you know our lives matter solely. It's you know as as I'm, I'm going to get on my soapbox now. I don't 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 honestly. It's not, don't go stay. And as a vegetarian of very long standing, I understand how the cow and the pig must feel in relation to the vampire and me. I don't want to be eaten or have my blood sucked out of me. And that's what we are to to, to vampires. We're cattle. Yes. You know, we're, we're, we're the larder, basically. That's right. And we, we hate the idea, don't we, I think, that we are not top of the food chain. Top of the food we're, chain, we're, yeah. We're the, we're the kings of the world kind of thing. And uh, Exactly. And we're not. There's these creatures that have been around since the dawn of time. Yes. Supposedly. Who, you know who are above us who will prey on us you know we are their victims and the difference is as well you know yes zombies want to eat us too but there's something more sentient more intense they're often smarter than us vampires as well that's the other thing yes, right that's the worst thing about them zombies can't help themselves yes it's just pure instinct vampires know full well what they're doing and yeah. you know what they don't care. Yeah. They don't care because they have to stay, I was going to say stay alive. They have to stay undead. Mm-hmm. They have to continue to exist. And they don't care if they're going to have to feed on us. Mm-hmm. So what? We're just, you know, we're just a handy food supply for them. Exactly. And that's if, what makes them scary. Absolutely. And the, and they, you know, like you say, zombies are kind of brain dead. They am, they're amoral. They do what they do just by instinct, right? Vampires kind of enjoy what they do. They actually enjoy... Yes killing people and draining them if anything they kind of get off on it right yeah you know over time sort of you know certainly in the early in the early mythology i don't think there was any sexiness involved in that but in, in sort yeah. of modern mythologies yeah the vampire has become increasingly sexy and increasingly yeah. romantic yeah i love it so uh so it's so interesting that the vampire as a creature goes back as far as it does like you say but mm. where where did it kind of obviously you know to a lot of people it kind of begins with bram stoker's dracula right yeah, of course um, of and we'll course. talk about that in just a moment but first of all just out of interest are there any earlier literary examples of vampires there are yeah i mean john polidori's story the vampire that came out in 1819 which was 80 years before dracula and featured his uh, undead character lord ruthven mm-hmm. who you know he's kind of the archetype of what we now imagine the vampire is going to be so yeah. you know sophisticated aristocrat you know, erudite, yes. quite chatty, quite talkative, drink your blood. You know, he's like, that's that's where it kind of started from. Mm. Um, Sheridan Lefanu's Carmilla predates 
Dracula. So we had, you know, the first first female vampire, the first lesbian vampires were mm. before Dracula. Um, we had things like the, the Penny Dreadfuls, which were these cheap sort of, you know, pulp, uh, pa- not paper, they were kind of like magazines, pamphlets that were published, you know, sort of for the masses. Yeah. Penny Dreadfuls, because they cost a penny and the stories were dreadful. You know, they were <laughs> horrible. Dreadful in the sense of horror, you know, yes. they were horrific. They were pulp. And, the, you know, there was a character in that, a very popular character in the serial called Varney the Vampire. Yes. But these were, you know, these these were all, you know, popular enough stories. But Dracula really is sort of year one, isn't it? It's it's where this is where it comes into the mainstream. Stoker's book was such a huge hit, mm-hmm. and it encapsulated everything that we think of now as the vampire, this sort of you know, erudite aristocrat. I think the fangs come from Dracula, right? You know, they fangs aren't really mentioned in the earlier stuff. Mm. Um, so you know, the, the the popular image of Dracula and vampires in general starts with that book, and yeah. I don't think it's any problem to say yeah dracula is the beginning of it all we can we can trace all these roots back to you know thousands of years ago in the past but for most people it's going to be bram stoker and quite right too yeah dracula you know obviously so influential in vampire mythology yeah. vampire stories but also just horror in general right i mean it's got to be one of yeah. the most important pieces of literature ever I absolutely would say. Yeah. everybody that's ever written a vampire story yeah you know, be stephen king or stephanie meyer or anne rice or any of thousands of others they all owe stoker a debt yeah they've all read it they all know what the rules are yes. and they've twisted the rules and that's the beauty about having rules is that they're there to be broken and twisted and mm. turned and you know do what you like with them but it was Stoker that established those those rules for the modern take on the vampire. What, so, yeah. what is it about that no, that story specifically and that character of Dracula, do you think, that has struck such a chord with people over and over again? Well, certainly back in the day when it was first published, you know, we have to bear in mind that, you know, the world was even more racist than it is now. And in mm. Britain in particular, you have this idea of this foreigner that was going to infiltrate polite society yes. and drink the blood of our women. You know, this was terrifying to polite society back in the day. So, yeah, he was a very popular character because he kind of, as vampires tend to do, he was kind of a metaphor for a lot of things that were going on mm. in the world at the time. Mm-hmm. And But for other people, you know, over time, over the years, the character is because it's, because it's year zero, because it is the urtext of, of modern vampirism, we can go back to it, look at it, think that's where they got it from. That's mm. where um, Vampire Lestat comes from, you yes, know. That's definitely. that's where Barlow comes from, mm-hmm. you know, Mr. Barlow. They, they, they all come from Dracula. They're all there. And it's this sort of almost stereotype of this very almost affable Yes. aristocrat who could lure you in with his sort of hypnotic ways and but he's going to prey on you and of course that that's really interesting as well isn't it that you know he is an aristocrat and he was invariably um, preying on the local peasants yes you know so you have that whole sort of working class versus middle class versus aristocracy thing going on which again you know it's the malleability of the vampire legend that you mm-hmm. can do that you can twist it into anything you want it to be but yeah. it was all there in dracula it was all there to be teased out and discovered you're so right yeah and that that feeling of um the, the sort of otherness i'm rereading the book at the moment and of course there's so much is described in the first few yeah. chapters of just jonathan being in this other place and how yes weird yeah. you know eastern europe is and the kind Carpathians yeah. and all of that and then yeah. this idea that there's this like strange figure lurking in this gothic castle in the middle of nowhere and then impending on us right coming to England sure. and bringing his ways to England yeah well I think Eastern Europe was kind of a, a, a really strange place for people when Dracula first came out you know so Asia seemed very exotic yes you know, there was a, you know, we'd had all sorts of, you know, frankly, quite racist things like Fu Manchu and stuff, but it had an exoticism to it. Western Europe, we kind of understood, mm-hmm. mainly because we wanted to go to war with them. So, you know, we kind of understood <laughs> who they were. And if we weren't actually at war with them, we were planning to be at war with them sometime soon. Eastern Europe was this bit of a mystery. Yes. It sort of straddled Eastern, Eastern Europe and, you know, sort of Western Asia. There was this part, you know, it wasn't quite and Dracula is this sort of character who doesn't doesn't belong yeah. in Europe. He doesn't belong in Asia. He doesn't really belong anyway. Certainly doesn't belong in Whitby or in <laughs> London. You know, certainly we should yeah, we don't want his sort here, thank no. you very much, you know. And uh, so yeah, see so uh, 
at the time when it came out, you can see quite why it was a hit because it was this strange character of this dark place that was, you know, clearly it was breeding monsters, this strange part of the world. And now they were coming for us, you know, they were invading us from the east. You know, it's terrible. And yeah, exactly. But, but yet there's also Dracula as a character. He's just sort of other enough. But yeah. also he's very, like you've talked about, he's affable, he's charming, he's alluring, right, as well. And I think there's something in that, you know, the character that's been portrayed, you know, hundreds of times yeah. ever since, right? There's something so attractive about Dracula, I think, isn't there? Absolutely. He's, he's erudite, he's learned, he, yeah. you know, he has a library, he wants his library sorted out, you know, he's... he's, 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 he's you know, lawyers buying in places in Whitby. He's he's a man of the well, I said twentieth century, but the nineteenth century. He's he was a he was a modern man who just happened to have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah, and so this makes him quite a sort of dichotomy that he's sort of a product of a very long gone period of time but he was you know like when people complain that you know oh you know dracula should always be set in the 1800s well actually when dracula was written it was set in the modern day so you know it was yeah he was a very contemporary figure and that was i think part of what was so pleasing about him was that he came from an unknowable past and yet he was walking amongst us and he had no problem walking amongst us there was no sort of no culture shock because he'd lived through it all. And he, he was just part of our world. He just happened to come from an even longer line into our world, you know. And so, yeah, you've got that. And, you know, because he was so powerful, he's sexy, he's hypnotic, he's, you know, he's the perfect the perfect monster in so many ways. Is is the vampire, and, you know, speaking of, is the vampire not the sexiest monster in horror, oh, yeah. right? I mean, it's got to be. <laughs> nobody in their, well, I'll say nobody in their right mind. Who am I to judge? But nobody wants to have sex with the zombie that I know of. And, you know, tr- trying to do the business with a ghost is really going to be tricky, isn't it? So, I mean, you know, vampires are corporeal. They, they yeah. exist. They're physical. And but they're not brainless. They're not mm-hmm. going to you know eat you on the first you know first night. They're going to mm-hmm. seduce you slowly. Uh, they're going to drain you of your blood, which is a very sexual image in itself. Yes. Um, they have great power. They walk the night unmolested. You know they're mm-hmm. afraid of nothing. They're so cool because they don't care what you think. The epitome, the actual proper definition of cool is not caring what other people think. Right. Yeah. And yeah. vampires don't give a toss. You know, your your food, your cattle, and that's it. That's all they, they care about. You know, if, if you happen to be in their way, fine, they'll drink your blood and they'll move on. And that's kind of strangely quite sexy, isn't it? That you've yes. got this character that's so sort of couldn't give a damn. And he's just, you know. Yeah, I think that's true. And there's something of it. I remember we talked about this a bit when we discussed the kind of occult um, mm. side of horror. There's something about it that then attracts a kind of almost counterculture because, you know, these people, like vampires don't live by society's rules, right? Sure, You yeah. also get the feeling they're kind of all probably bisexual or pansexual. Yeah, live yeah. however they want to live. Uh, they sleep with whoever they want to sleep with. They do whatever they want. It goes back to that. It's like that occultist. It's like that Alistair Crowley thing, do what thou wilt, right? And yep. it kind of represents a rejection yep. of the uh, yep. the restrictions of Christian norms of, of the course. time, right? And that, there's something very attractive about that. And it, and it sort of leaks out into the real world. The whole goth subculture owes so much to the image of, of vampires. There is, and there's a documentary, the title of which I can't remember. I will try to remember it for you before this goes live and mm. I can pass it on to you. But there is a documentary about... And people, mainly in America, young people who identify as vampires, yes, who drink each other's right. blood, yes, and it's like a proper little subculture that's that's going on there. So yeah, the whole thing has leaked out into the real world in a way that, you know, we go on our zombie walks and all the rest of it, we go <laughs> ghost hunting, but we we don't sort of follow it through. You know, we don't no. kill ourselves and come back from the dead, but people do drink blood. Yeah, whether they still do with you know sort of the, or AIDS and all the rest, of it, I don't know. But it was quite a thing in the seventies and eighties that there were these sub cultures of you know young people who identified with with vampires and wanted to be a vampire yeah it's, and, and it's of, very strange it's very strange and of course like you can see it particularly in eras like the 70s right where it, of course people do latch onto that idea of vampire movies can be basically erotic can be basically softcore porn a lot of the time that kind of and, thing, and, you know? and worse oh yeah, yeah. worse trust me they're, they're, you know it, it, was, it wasn't confined to softcore how do I know this I'm a researcher you know, that, that's let's right. leave it at that you've let's done your homework yeah, I've done my good. homework several, several times no let's move on let's move on <laughs> no it's true it's 
it's really fascinating thing. Um, so obviously Dracula became this huge, this huge property. Yeah. Um, but where did vampires begin in film, Kev? When did we first see them on screen? Is it the obvious place? Well, when you say the obvious place, we're thinking Nosferatu, aren't we? We are. But yeah, it wasn't the first. Uh-huh. It wasn't. There was a film from 1921, about which we know very little. It was called Dracula Halala. Now, forgive me if I've mispronounced that, or Dracula's Death. And it was a Hungarian film from 1921. It's now lost. It's been lost for decades and decades. There's a couple of stills have survived and some posters, but there's nothing of the film. Directed by a guy called Karoli Lajthe and starred one Paul Asconas as Dracula. And this was a shorter film. It was only sort of part of the the novel. Dracula's death, I would assume, is literally the end of the film. Mm, But this was, you know, in 1921, so it beat Nosferatu by a good couple of years. There have been rumours over time about a Russian film that was simply called Dracula, which was supposedly made in 1920. Right. Possibly directed by somebody called Viktor Turjansky and featuring a cast of Ukrainian actors. But the thing is, no evidence that this thing actually exists has ever turned up. It was mentioned in a few books here and there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people, there was even a video popped up on YouTube many years ago. People saying, oh, we found it. We found extracts from it. It turned out it was fake. It was a hoax. People had just made it to look like it's right. right. <laughs> and I wonder if maybe there was just, you know, I've done film research for years and I know what a minefield it is out there of misinformation. There is a Victor Turjansky mm. who was the assistant director on the Lucio Fulci film Dracula in the Provinces in 1975. Amazing. I wonder if somewhere this name just got attached to something and 1920 came up and maybe it was being confused with a Hungarian film. Mm. I don't know, but no one's ever found any evidence that this film actually exists but we ought to mention that there might be a 1921 there's definitely a 1921 Mm -hmm. but there might be a 1921 so it predates Nosferatu by a year. That's interesting, isn't it? And, and in some ways, it does kind of surprise me that a vampire... I mean, of course, it might have happened, like you say, so many films have been lost since then, but like yeah. that vampires didn't pop up in early, early cinema, kind of pre-1920. But uh, We had films that were called, you know, The Vampire and things like that, right. but they tended to be vamps. You know, sort of right. in, 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 the, in the actual sense of the word, like, you know, sort of vampish women. Yes, yes, Who yes. were, you know, sort of luring men to their doom, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So they were kind of, they had an element of vampire, but they weren't the vampires that we, yeah, you know, kind of were talking adjacent, about Yeah, kind of vampire adjacent. Vampire adjacent, yeah. And um, so, yeah, there were a few of those around, but, you know, that most of those, as with most silent films, are long gone and we, you know, we know so That's little it. about them, sadly. So there you, you know. go. So it was, in fact, a hundred years ago this year, F. W. Murnau's Nosferatu that really kicked it all off, right? Yes. And this was, of course, uh, an unofficial adaptation of uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Well, so unofficial that um, Florence Stoker, Bram's widow, d- decreed that all prints should be destroyed because they hadn't <gasps> asked for permission to, to adapt it. Thank God they weren't. Oh, thank God. One print apparently survived, which is where we've got all the, all the stuff from at the moment. But um, they tried to change all the names, as I mentioned. You know, they changed the uh, the name of the ship. But, you know, Dracula becomes Graf Orlok, mm-hmm. brilliantly played by Max Schreck as this sort of... Hor- he's a real monster, this this Dracula. He's, you know, the, yeah, he's Orlok, but he's Dracula. We know he is. He's bat-like. He is parasitical. He sort of lives in this dank, horrible castle. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant performance by Max Schreck. Absolutely wonderful. Still one of the very best portrayals of Dracula I think still absolutely terrifying to this day and it was so important because you know for a long time it was unavailable you couldn't see it there mm. were sort of whispered rumors of it but the still survived yeah and people saw the pictures long before they saw the the um, films and that image you know of, of the of the talon like clawed like um, nails and the sort of the, the pinned back bat ears and the, mm. that horrible sort of mouth with the little horrible sharp teeth in it it really was a genuinely frightening image. It was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it still holds up, doesn't it? Like, there's something otherworldly about that whole film, I think, when you watch it, you know? It's I think it's a, it's a film that connects Dracula to those early mythology yes. versions of the vampire. Yes. You know, it, where he is a monster. He's not erudite. It's a silent film. He doesn't talk. 
you know, we, we have the intertitles, but we don't get, you know, the benefit of hearing him. So we use this kind of ethereal character from mythology who is not in the slightest bit sexy. Yeah. You know, he's not. You know, he does seduce the heroine. Yeah. But, you know, that's all through hypnotism. It's not through any latent sort of, you know, sexiness of his own. He's a, a real monster, and it's a fabulous film. And for those people who are a little resistant to silent film, please don't be. Please go and watch. If you only ever watch one silent film, make sure it's Nosferatu, because it yeah. is staggeringly brilliant. So I, good. I would argue, maybe controversially, that I, I find it... <clears throat> more interesting and more technically more visually stunning than dracula 1931 which feels very stagey to me in a lot of ways right and i'm with you yeah i'm with you yeah it's it's so striking the imagery in nosferatu that i actually it it grabs me more than than todd browning's dracula you know oh he does i I'm what, it's one of those things. I, I, I fear I'm, I'm straying back into Dawn of the Dead territory here, aren't I? But I, it, Dracula 1931 is one of those films that I absolutely recognise its importance. Yes. To the point where you say to most people, even now, you say to people, Dracula, and the first thing they think of is, I want to drink your blood. Yes. You know, you they do. think yeah. of Bella Lugosi yes. and they think of that image and that accent. That's what they think of. So it is hugely important. But yeah, as a. As a piece of cinema, Nosferatu knocks it for six. Mm. You know, it, you know the, the sorry fans, but the Universal Dracula is stodgy. It's slow. Yeah. There's an it's very stage bound. There's an awful lot of people rushing over to windows and going, "Good yeah. lord, he's turned into a bat!" Yes. You know that kind of thing. <laughs> Whereas in Nosferatu, you kind of see all this stuff. You do. You know, they show us these things. You know, it's really quite creepy. It's really quite eerie. It is. And, um, but let's let's talk about Dracula. Or is there anything else, by the way, before I before I move us on to Dracula nineteen thirty one? Was there anything else of note between Nosferatu and, and Todd Browning's Dracula? I don't think so, no, because I think, you know, when Florence tried to sue the makers of Nosferatu, that kind of deterred a lot of people, I think. What we'd got in its place was the stage play. Yes. Which toured America and which starred Bella Lugosi. Right. And in fact, the universal uh, Dracula is more from the stage play than it is from the book. Absolutely. And indeed, most subsequent versions of Dracula have been from the stage play and not from the book. There's so much in the book that's never been filmed or rarely been filmed. You it's, know, it's so all come true. from the stage play. There's stuff yeah. that you forget. Is the, and, and yeah, you're right. I mean, isn't it interesting, the kind of stepping stones of, of how we get to the, the, the kind of common image of Dracula? Yeah. Uh, and you're right, the kind of the, the Nosferatu and then the play, and then, and then we arrive at Dracula 1931, yes. uh, which, like exactly as you said, Kev, whatever we may think of it, arguably one of the most important movies in, oh, yeah. in horror history, yeah. right? I mean, you know, that performance, that film, yeah. everything about it. I, I, the first time I ever chatted to Kim Newman, he kind of argued that, yes, we've had horror movies for 30 years up until this point, but you could sort of argue this is where the horror genre actually begins, really. It's where the modern horror genre begins. Yes. It's where the, the, the horror genre that we recognise yes. as horror begins yeah. with, it becomes with a genre almost it becomes you know? a genre yeah, yeah prior to yeah. that there had been films that were uncanny yeah and supernatural but this was where mm. horror was born i am dracula it's really good to see you i don't know what happened to the driver and my luggage and well and with all this i i thought i was in the wrong place i bid you welcome this, the, without this film, we wouldn't have had the universal horror films, mm-hmm. the 30s and 40s. Without them, it's very unlikely we would have had the Hammer films. Yeah. And without them, we wouldn't have had the reaction to the Hammer films, which happened in the 70s, which gave us that little golden age of American mm. horror, and so on and so on. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not a great fan of Dracula. I don't hate it. Again, it's like Dawn of the Dead. I don't hate it. Mm. I just think it's been kind of overrated a little bit but i understand why it's overrated i understand its importance in the scheme of things absolutely i I, especially when you when you look at it next to frankenstein i think which came out the same year and i go oh my god frankenstein is so much more exciting i think and uh, yeah but 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 yeah the the dracula you cut like it's bella lugosi's performance right like you said if anyone thinks of the character of dracula or even just a vampire they will probably put on that accent and they will like that's what everyone even even young kids I think that yeah. will never have seen the 1931 film will know that that's how a Dracula character speaks, right? But they would have seen things that 
sort of imitated that. Yes. They'll have seen the Monster Squad, where yes. the character <laughs> is quite clearly meant to be Bella Lugosi. They will have seen all these other things where, you know, it's always Bella Lugosi. Despite the fact that there have been much better Dracula since, he is the, the one that has stuck in stuck in the public's consciousness you know that, that's who they think of and it's uh, incredible isn't it and all those fascinating stories from behind the scenes about how bella lugosi barely could speak english and so he was having to yeah, just kind yeah. of phonetically learn the yeah. words and repeat yeah. them right and and but it's become so iconic that accent and that delivery listen to them children of the night what music they make it's easy to mock now to look at 30s films and say, oh, yeah, they, were all, they weren't sexy at all, were they? Mm. In 1931, Bella Lugosi was a sex symbol. Right. You yeah. know, the, the, the ladies in the audience were swooning over Bella. You know, that <laughs> yeah. accent, that, that, that piercing stare, you know, this, again, this power that the character mm. had, you know, he was, you know, it's not as overt as it would become in later films, but no. it's still there. You know, it it's, really in is. context, it was definitely there. Yeah, it's what. Yeah, it's an incredible thing, isn't it? Really, yeah, just how important yeah. that movie became. And when you consider that he actually only played um, Dracula twice. Yeah. yeah, the next time he played it was in Abbott and Costello, right? Is that right? that's right? Yeah. yeah, he's spoofing it after he played other vampires, but he didn't play Dracula again until Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein in 1948. So it's it, and yet he's absolutely 100% identified with that character. Amazing, isn't it? And of course, you know, as we all know, and it's been told in documentaries and even in the mm. films like Ed Wood, but yeah. he did have a bit of a sad life and career post this film, didn't he, really? And he yeah. was really very much attached to that character until his death, wasn't he? He, so, he was, yeah. I, as I gather, he was buried in the cape and the ring, yeah. wasn't he? And he was, yeah. you know, it was one of those things, I think it was both a curse and a blessing for him. Yeah. It, it gave him the break in Hollywood that he so wanted mm -hmm. but I think he found it I don't know but maybe he found it more difficult to embrace being a horror star mm. than Boris Karloff did mm -hmm. where Boris Karloff just went with it and right well, yeah. this is what they want this is what I give them I think I think Lugosi maybe wanted to do more yes. but was, he kept being typecast and then you know, so he, we we know the whole story, the awful story about going to drugs and all the mm. rest of it. He was having to take whatever work was offered. Yeah. That work wasn't of the best quality because he wasn't as reliable as he once was. Yeah. You know, at his best in Dracula, you know, as we said, he is the definitive image. Mm. He may not be the definitive Dracula for me, but he's the definitive image of yes. Dracula. And Completely we can never take that away from him. You know, no matter what other junk he did later on, that's what we should remember him for, for playing Absolutely. Dracula. And uh, he will always be remembered for that. Yeah. He? yeah. Um, and like you say, Bella himself wasn't in any other um, movies up until the Abbott and Costello one, but we yeah. did have kind of other Dracula and vampire movies in, as part of the universal sort of we era, did. didn't we? We had yeah. another Dracula. We yes. had a Spanish language. I mean, it was quite common back then for... You know, as sound had just come in, mm. it was far too difficult and expensive for them to dub people you know so yes. what they used to do it was actually cheaper to just make the film again <laughs> in, a, in another language <laughs> you know that, that we turned up um, german versions of laurel and hardy films yes where they um they basically just learned the scripts phonetically yeah and had no idea what they were saying but just did it anyway <laughs> and while dracula was being shot during the day mm. by todd browning George Melford was coming in at night with his actor, Carlos Villarius, and shooting a Spanish language version of it. Amazing. Which some people say is superior. Better, I think I yeah. prefer it. Right. I, I don't think Villarius is quite as good as Lugosi. Mm -hmm. I think if we'd have got Lugosi being directed by Melford, mm. we would have had a completely unbeatable early version of Dracula. Yeah. Um, the, the Spanish version is longer. It has more time to breathe. And it includes things that we don't see in the um, American version. If you've never seen it, again, I can highly recommend go to, to find it. You, it it's, I think it's on just about all copies of the DVDs and Blu-rays these days. So you should be able to track it down fairly easily. It's quite an instructive watch mm -hmm. to see that. But then we know we had, we had um, Dracula disappeared for a while. We had his daughter yes. in 1936, played by Gloria Holden. Her pulse is weak, Dr. Goss. Growing weaker. All your skill can't help her now. She's under a spell that can be broken only by me. I am Dracula's daughter. Which is kind of interesting. It might be, 
depending on how you read it, mm. it might be the first lesbian vampire film. Uh-huh. Now, of course, they couldn't come out and say, yes, she's a lesbian, not in 1936. That mm-hmm. was you know, never going to happen. But it's coded. It's in there. You, you, know, you don't have to scratch too far beneath the surface to find this sort of you know, lesbian vampire story lurking beneath it. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Gloria Holden is in the title role. Very, very good she is too. Yeah. Um, we then had Lon Chaney Jr. turning up as, yes. a, as a slightly well-fed Dracula. He has to be the old son of Dracula in 1943. I love yeah. Lon Chaney, but he was a bit stocky, really, to be playing Dracula, I think. And, uh, yeah. Son of Dracula, searing the screen with new terror in this weird tale of the living dead who rise from the grave at night to prey on unsuspecting victims. But he turned up as the son of Dracula in 43, and then Dracula turned up in two of what they call the monster rallies. Mm. These were films where um, Universal decided to go for broke. They yeah. got Earl C. Kenton in, they got John Carradine to play Dracula, and they just pitched every other monster going. So you got Dracula, <laughs> the Wolfman, Frankenstein, they were all there together in the same films. So you got um, House of Frankenstein in 1944 and House of mm. Dracula a year later. And yeah. then, of course, um, poor old Bella turns up sort of sending himself up in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein in 1948, yes. which is kind of the beginning of the end of the classic universal monster. Once you start spoofing something, it. it's, it's reaching the end. You know, It's time and, uh, for a, a revamp, so to speak, right? As, as it were, yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which I guess we, we get 10 years later, very notably, don't we? When we, we come do. over to When we come over to England with, with, with Hammer Horror. And, uh, oh, yes. And Hammer's 1958 movie, Dracula. Now, I'm yes. guessing you're a bigger fan of this than of the universal Dracula. Yes. Oh, yes. It's a horror of Dracula for our American listeners. That's right. Uh, but Dracula over here. And... Yeah, I mean this. This is my Dracula. I've often mm. wondered if there are sort of, there's a, there are generational divides when mm. it comes to Dracula. That people older than me, and yes, hard to believe there are people <laughs> older than me out there still into these things. They think Lugosi is is the man. For me, it's Christopher Lee always right. because I grew up watching him on television. Yeah, you now yeah. younger people may have grown up watching Frank Langella or mm. Gary Oldman mm-hmm. or you know sort of very young listeners. You shouldn't be listening to this, but very long, young listeners, maybe Clay's Bang will be there. That's Dracula, right. Yeah. Yes. But for me, it's always and forever Christopher Lee. Mr. Harker, I'm glad that you've arrived safely. Count Dracula, I am Dracula, and I welcome you to my house. I must apologise for not being here to greet you personally, but I trust that you have found everything you needed. When we first see him in the first Dracula film, and he comes scurrying down the stairs, walks right up to the camera, and says, I am Dracula, I bid you welcome. And there's no accents, there's no sort of, like, it's just matter of fact. Mm. Be- that beautiful voice that Christopher Lee had. We all talk about his physical presence, but what a voice. Oh. What a voice. And then there's this, one of my favourite scenes in any Hammer film, and it's a tiny little throwaway scene. I've banged on about this elsewhere, but... Mm. He picks up the bags and walks up the stairs, and he goes up the stairs two at a time. Yes, yes. and and you know it's like he's, he's running behind him, scurrying after him, trying to keep up with him. This power that he has, and he just lifts these heavy bags and strides up the stairs. Beautifully concise shot, mm. absolutely brilliantly economic. He's actually laying out just how powerful this man is without any sort of, you know, grandstanding about it. Absolutely beautiful. Love it's a it. brilliant film. We could, I, could, I could talk all day about it, but let's not. It's, oh, I um, love it. It's, yeah. it's great, you know. And it was, it was a big change for the way that vampires were represented. We now really were seeing sexy vampires. Mm. You know, Christopher yes. Lee was a very good-looking guy, had lots of charisma. The women, when they were bitten, and again, it, it was always women, their reactions were almost orgasmic. Yes. They weren't in pain. They were enjoying this in a strange sort of way, you know? And, you know, the, we, we have in the first film, we have his bride who tries to bite. It's um, you know, he's Jonathan, isn't it? In the, in the film, That's trying right. to bite him. And he comes in and he's, he's standing at the doorway, blood pouring down his cheeks, hissing at, him, at her and throws across in this sort of fit of almost sexual jealousy. Yes. You know, yes. he's mine. The man is mine, you know? And it's like, it really, really, really did change the way people perceived sex in horror films, the, the, the Hammer vampire films. They became increasingly sexy as they went <laughs> along. And, you know, they introduced violence. Yes. They introduced blood. We actually saw blood. We actually saw fangs. 
Yes, we, we haven't did. seen fangs on screen before. You know, real and long saw, fangs and red bloods and red all of that blood. kind of imagery. Had, yeah, that Kensington gore they called it, which was like impossibly red blood. They they introduced absolute mayhem in the films. You know, these these were violent characters, and later on they'd introduce us to lesbian vampires. You know, which again was something which. It happened a lot in the 70s, but mostly after Hammer had really sort of given it a start. I think, you know, like Jean Roland, who we'll mention again later, he kind of had one in 1969, which sort of like was the start of it. Mm -hmm. But it was the vampire lovers that really sort of led the way. So Hammer were absolute pioneers with this stuff. And it's like, for me, it is the definitive Dracula film scene. We'll, we'll draw a veil over the terrible scars of Dracula. The less said about that, the better. But ignoring that, it is the definitive Dracula series. And I even love the ones where they bring them up to date yes. and put, put him in the 1970s. I still love that. And I know Christopher Lee, he, bless him, he complained all the time that Dracula didn't have much to say or do. Mm. But he was this really eerie presence in all of the films. Even yeah. when he wasn't talking, he was just there. This malevolent presence. Such gravity. Is it, is it in um, Prince of Darkness where he basically doesn't talk, right? Dracula, Prince of yeah. Darkness. He doesn't really have any doesn't lines, does he? But he no. doesn't matter. You know, yeah. he he didn't like that, but he doesn't matter because he's, his physical presence is enough to convey so much, you know, and he's just absolutely remarkable performance so yeah good. it's it's funny isn't it it's almost a bit like what we we're saying with bella lugosi too it's almost like this curse of these actors who kind of they yeah. desperately want to do something else or escape this dracula yeah. kind of uh, <laughs> yeah you know figure and they can't and christopher lee has that same frustration doesn't he in his career you know i think he's yeah. slightly over overstated that you know so people saying oh we'll never talk about dracula you know i went to a number of signings and was sort of behind the scenes on signings with him and he was quite happy to talk about dracula as long as you talked about Jinnah, you know the film he made later as long as you talk about star wars or lord of the rings don't just talk to him about dracula because you know in fairness these were films he'd made 30 40 50 years before and would like you know small part of his career for us for the fans they're everything for him you know and he was never i don't think he was ever ashamed of them he, i think he just wished people to shut the hell up about them <laughs> you know, he just kept <laughs> yeah. getting asked about them all the time but, uh, oh god so you mentioned this already briefly but uh what happened to vampire movies uh, you know, towards the end of the 60s, early 70s, after we had those slightly sexier Hammer films, vampire movies got very sexy, didn't they? They got se they got very sexy, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so certainly by the time we got to 1970 and the vampire lovers, Hammer, you know, sort of taking the gloves off, they were taking everything else off as well, basically. <laughs> you know, Ingrid yeah. Pitt getting out of the bath and, you know, so yes. it was, I mean, nudity was, was in, in a big mm. way. And the, the lesbianism was a lot less implied. The vampire lovers. Perverted creatures of the night find their victims everywhere. You know, again, we're not talking about, you know, hardcore super sex here, but we are talking about a, a, a marked upping of the stakes, if you'll pardon the expression. You know, <laughs> the, 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 things, were, things were getting more naked. They were getting raunchier. Mm. Um you know, over in Europe, we had Jean Roland, who I've mentioned, who was the king of those sort of weird experimental lesbian vampire films. And he was pushing, the, as, as you know, sort of terribly repressed in this country. You know, we were going to allow some nudity and some sex, but, mm. oh, good Lord, no. The camera would still look away when we got to certain bits. But in, in Europe, none of that. You know, they're much more frank about sexuality. So we had Roland, we had uh, Jesus Franco, who's of making course. vampire films, of course. And, you know, these were far more explicit than anything that we were getting here. And, yeah. you know, it, it was it was the moment where vampires stopped being slightly sexy and became full-on sex symbols, <laughs> yeah. you know? It's like, yeah, totally. Yeah. And so that, that was kind of happening here and, you know, in, in Europe, where we were still holding on to slightly onto the sort of the gothic feel because that mm. kind of, I think in some ways it mitigated against the sexiness. Uh, yes. Because we gave it a little bit of distance because it was set in the past. But in America, they were going off in a new direction. Mm. They were dragging the vampire into the 20th century and largely into urban settings. Yes. So we were getting films like, you know, Count Yorga. Count Yorga, Vampire, is a film that throws you into a world of which we know little. Strange, frightening, whispered from generation to generation until it becomes a scream out of the past. In fact, Count Yorga Vampire had actually started out as a porn film. 
Uh huh. That's that was what they were going to count Iorga Vampire, mm-hmm. which is a title you'll still see on most prints today. But he started out as a porn film, and they decided, actually, no, let's not do a porn film. Let's do a horror film, because horror films, you know, there's more of them. They make more money, and we're probably yeah. not going to go to prison if we get caught making this film. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, they, they, it started out as something a lot sexier than it was. But what it actually did was drag the vampire into the 20th century, beat Hammer to it, um, and it sort of proved that vampires could work away from the castles and the peasants and the screaming virgins and all the rest of it. And you could plant him down in modern-day California and he would still work, Mm. you know. And it was um, the start of a whole thing. I mean, William Marshall then went on to become Blackula. Yes. In Blackula and Scream, Blackula Scream. So we got our first black exploitation, Dracula. And again, very, very urban setting. We had a brilliant film called Ganger and Hess. (gasps) What a film. The only perversions that can be comfortably condemned are the perversions of others. I will persist and survive without God's or society's sanction. I will not be tortured. I will not be punished. I will not be guilty. Amazing film, which is a masterpiece. It's, it's often described as a black exploitation film. And I say that selling it short a little bit. Yeah. It's it's a film about black vampires, but it's not black exploitation. Don't get me wrong, I love black exploitation films. I absolutely love them. But Gander and Hess, it's several cuts above. A black exploitation film. It's an. The director was told go away and make a, a black exploitation vampire film. He came back with an art. film. It was an art house film, and absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's 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 a work of genius. Yeah. But again, it showed vampires in a modern setting. Yes. And this, you know, we we had Dark Shadows on TV, which had of vampires course. in a modern setting, and two spin off films. So this is where it was going, and this I suspect was in response to Night of the Living Dead, mm, mm-hmm. which you know sort of brought, um, you know, the sixties have been dominated by Hammer and by uh, the Roger Corman films you know the Edgar Allan Poe adaptations they're all gothic yeah. period pieces along comes um, Rosemary's Baby as well of course and um, Night of the Living Dead which drags Horace kicking and screaming into the modern world yeah. where surprise surprise it works phenomenally well who saw that coming you know and um, yeah, there, there, there had been films set in the modern times before that but these were the ones that really 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 did it yeah. and you know the vampire movie had to respond and it responded admirably i think you know and, some uh, fascinating as ever the 1970s that feels like we, we 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 talk about this with every subgenre but it's just some what a fascinating decade for some yeah. of these movies uh these kind of slightly more experimental ones like you say ganja and hess also these kind of on the fringes of being vampire movies, like George Romero's Martin, Martin or yes. Let's Scare Jessica to Death, yeah. these types of, again, so interesting, aren't they, these movies? Jessica. Paramount Pictures presents Let's Scare Jessica to Death. And this is where they start really experimenting with what vampires mean. Yes. And, you know, and again, it kind of annoys me. I mean, some, some of my friends, you know who you are, you're listening, who are sort of <laughs> my sort of age, you go, oh, no, 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 vampires have to be set in castles and all the rest. But you love Martin and you love Let's yeah. Go Jessica to Death. These are vampire films that have taken yeah. liberties mm-hmm. with the mythology and done something absolutely amazing with them. Over mm. in Europe, Harry Kumail did Daughters of Darkness, which oh. is... Yeah. What an amazing film. And again, sort of experimenting, pushing sexuality further, but also mm-hmm. very experimental in the way it was made. In, in a lot of ways, I think there were more interesting vampire films made in the 70s at any other time. Much as I love my Hammer Draculas, they're, the, they're my go-to films. But in terms of being interesting and challenging mm-hmm. and experimental it was the 70s again as with so much in horror the 70s is where all this sort of you know let's tear up the rule book and start again was was going on and particularly with vampires so many good films being made in that decade you know that's right yeah and then as is often the case again with with various subgenres it, it pushes into real mainstream territory in the 80s doesn't it yeah and suddenly vampires like you say they're modern day they're cool they're everywhere yeah. and you've we've got you know the lost boys the hunger near dark you know yeah. fright night all of these kind of very yeah. popular mainstream box office movies you know so where are you the boy none i'm your brother sammy help me stay back stay back what's happening to me star get yourself a good sharp stick when you 
And again, all very modern. They're all set in the modern day. And yeah. so the, the odd thing is that, you know, to, having been in my 20s in the 1980s, I can look back at it now and think, my God, they've dated more than the 70s films. I think you they, know, have. they, really they have. have. Yeah. yeah. The Lost Boys looks much more of its time than Martin does to me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Martin, it looks like it's just, you know, a slightly older film, but you couldn't really possibly date it, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But The Lost Boys, it couldn't have been made at any other time. You know, (laughs) it's it's such a product of its time. And yeah, vampires became cool. And again, Mm. I think that was, again, a, a sort of reaction thing, that we'd have this sort of 70s weirdness. Yeah. And all the rest of it. And filmmakers... Don't forget filmmakers. It's a bit like musicians, you know, when people say, oh, yeah, they were such originals. They were, you know, creating something. They weren't. They all grew Nobody grew up in a vacuum. They all grew up watching the same films. Yeah. And so, you know, the filmmakers in the 80s were watching Martin. They were watching, you know, Dark Shadows. They were watching the Hammer films in, in you know, late night TV slots. And so they were doing and looking at it and thinking, I want to do a vampire film, but I don't want to do it the way they've done it before. Right. And so you got this sort of move into something different. And it's kind of, it's interesting. You'll see, I think, you know, I, I know what's coming up in the next few episodes. I've seen your list. So you're going to illustrate this so well. This long, strange journey that the vampire has gone from, from this animalistic, parasitical Max Shrek all the way through to Robert Pattinson sparkling beautifully <laughs> in the sunlight. It's been a yes. long, strange journey with so many stops in between, you know? Yes. And in fact, yeah, and this is just the way the vampire keeps reinventing itself, I suppose. Yeah. You know, yeah. It just keeps coming up with something new all the time. Exactly so, that. And it's yeah. these stepping stones, isn't it? Because we, we're sort of verging into, um, they're being skewed younger too. They're teenage vampires at this point with things like the Lost Boys as well, right? That's as well, right, it's, yeah. It's suddenly becoming like teenage gangs and or, te- you know, yeah. that kind of thing. And that that obviously very much feeds into what we've had since, you know. Of course, so, yeah. And, yeah. you know, of course they were going younger because that's where horror was in the 1980s. Yes. You know, but with the slasher movie had, had introduced us to a new audience that, it was always there, but it was much more vocal now, this mm-hmm. young audience. Uh, who didn't want to see Christopher Lee, I don't think. You know, they didn't want to see the older guy playing the vampire anymore. They wanted to see people of their own age, or they wanted to see rock stars like David Bowie. You yeah. know, so you, you you get the Lost Boys, you get the Hunger, you get Near Dark, where they you know, predominantly younger people. There are a couple of older characters in it, but they are effortlessly cool and of course you know the, the hero is very young right exactly. and the heroine very young so you know they're, they're pitching it they knew their target audience it may not have been me mm. you know and i've said this about so many things like you know i know you're a fan of buffy the vampire slayer i never got it um i, I never got twilight but they weren't aimed at me yes it's you know their target audiences was was somebody else yeah and um, i wouldn't expect uh, you know a fan of twilight to get horror of dracula or no you know even dracula ad dracula ad 1972 you show that to a twilight fan they're probably just going to piss themselves laughing for an hour and a half because it's just going to make no sense of the whatsoever but and that's as it should be in a way that's as it should be it should leave me behind because it's moved on i may not like where it's gone but that's neither here nor there I, it's, it's not important whether i like it or not yeah. And what it did go, of course, was it became more mainstream. Yes. It became more blockbusty. So you had, you know, Bram Stoker's Dracula. You will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old and has many bad memories. Be warned. I'm sure I understand. You were talking about, you know, each generation has their own Dracula, whether it's Frank Langella or Christopher Lee. I guess this is the closest one to my generation. Sure. I was born in 87. It was probably Gary Oldman for me yeah, that was yeah. my Dracula growing up. To be honest, it, it, it was a line that for me that should never have been crossed. You know, like, <laughs> Dra- Dracula was meant to, as I said before, Dracula should have been this parasitic creature living in his castle. He shouldn't have been mooning about over some lost love and crying because his girlfriend's dead. You know, like, for God's so sake, funny. get a grip, it's... man. Get a grip. You know, you've survived centuries. So. It's sort of become a bit of a cult classic now, Bram Stoker's Dracula. It has. He People absolutely yeah. love yeah. it. It's become they almost do. it's it's got it, you know that happens, doesn't it, with these kind of sort of campy movies? They yeah. kind of go they go they almost come all the way around to the other side where people now are kind of lauding it as a forgotten masterpiece almost. I know? don't get it, I must admit. You know, I tried watching it again, you know, a couple of years ago to review for my website and I I I just don't get it. It's it's not my idea of Dracula, and that's fine. You know, you, you can't love every single Dracula adaptation. You, you you'd be weird if you did. But you know, it, it introduced this sort of notion of 
the romantic vampire. Yes. And we see it in things like Interview with the Vampire, the Twilight films and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There were, there were mm. more, if not more, certainly as much about the romance. Yeah. As it was. In fact, I suffered. Th- I, sorry, sorry. I did my research with Twilight last night. Um, so, sorry, Twilight fans. Honestly, I'm, I'm 60 this year. This film is not aimed at me. Trust me. No, and nor me, to be honest. I, but yeah, I was watching it and thinking, you could have taken these vampires out and put in the X Men, and it would have worked exactly the same. They're not vampires. Absolutely. It's got nothing to do with vampirism at all. But this no. is where it went in the end. It became this sort of romantic. The, the vampire became a romantic hero. You know what you are. Your skin is pale white and ice cool. You don't go out into the sunlight. Say it out loud. Say it. Vampire. Are you afraid? No. This isn't real. This kind of stuff just doesn't exist. It does in my world. And in Buffy, you've got, you know, you've got Spike and you've got Angel. So they were, you know, these were the romantic anti-hero figures, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, Interesting that it... Interesting that they they were still quite big and mainstream. Again, maybe compared to something like Zombies, which yeah. felt like they were probably more on the fringes, more just for horror fans. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Vampire movies, again, look at things like Interview with the Vampire, uh, From Dust Till Dawn. You've got big names, George Clooney and Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt and people. It's like vampires were still respectable in Hollywood, weren't they, as well? Of course. And I think we mentioned this in the Ghost Story one. Go back yeah. and have a listen. But it, it's to do with the literary connection, I'm sure of right. it. Right. Yeah. Vampires yeah. come from literature. Zombies don't. You know, there was never any great. So there was never a Bram Stoker for, for zombie novels. It was, yes. you know, it was. It came from, you know, sort of folklore, mythology, and then through horror movies, and mainly, let's be honest, from Night of the Living Dead. So there yeah. was never that respectability. Whereas with yeah. the vampire film, even something as wonderfully trashy and gory as, as From Dust Till Dawn. Yeah. Which I love, but I mean, let's face it, it's it's very trashy and it was meant to be. Oh, it is. The whole it point is. of it, it was meant to be a trash film and I love it for yeah. that. Even that, you know, George Clooney could think, well, you know, I'm in long line of descent here from Bela Lugosi and then Bram Stoker. <laughs> you know, yes. you can justify yeah. it to yourself that way. Whereas, you know, in a zombie film, it's like, yeah, it's just blood and gore, isn't it? And guts hanging out. Yeah, of course he did. That's why we exactly. love them. But, you know, that's, but, you know, that's what happened in the 90s. They became... I don't know whether sanitized is the right word, but they became softened, I think, vampires. They they were no longer terrifying. They were no longer, you know, these people who sort of lurked in the dark dungeons of their castle. There were occasional glimpses. There's a, a TV show which I, I want to talk, I've been wanting to talk about vampires, so I could recommend this TV show to people. Excellent. Only ran for one season in 1998 called Ultraviolet on Channel 4. These aren't isolated cases. They're organising for a reason. What for? They don't want to wipe us out. They need us. Exactly. So what's changed? Our capacity for self-destruction. It grows at an exponential rate. Written and directed by Joe Ahern. Mm -hmm. And it it was about high-tech vampires. So in the modern day, the word vampire is never mentioned. Never mentioned in all six episodes. And it's about Jack Davenport, who plays a cop... Who yeah. um, his partner and best friend is on the take, and it turns out he's on the take from a clandestine underground of vampires, and he, they've turned him, and he, Jack Davenport then gets sort of drafted into this kind of Vatican-sanctioned hit squad, who include a very young Id- Idris Elba. I mean, this is how cool this program is. It's got Amazing. Idris Elba being young and brilliant, and it turns out that the vampires are highly organised and trying to start a nuclear winter. So that oh, wow. they can reduce the human population to almost nothing, just enough to live on, but they can walk about then in daylight because it will be in overcast. Brilliant Amazing. program. Only ran for six episodes, got cancelled just as it was getting really brilliant. But seriously, this this was the complete antithesis to the whole sort of, you know, romantic vampire thing. Yeah. These vampires were monsters. I mean, they yeah. were unconscionable. They were going to wipe out the whole of mankind they, you know, they didn't want to have sex with us. They wanted to destroy us and just leave a few. <laughs> There's a wonderful line in it where Jack Davenport is told our free rage days are over mm-hmm. because that's what they were going to do. They were going to kill most of us, but keep a few of us left for, as I said earlier, cattle. Wow. And this was that little blip in 1998 where it was amidst all this sort of romanticizing of the vampire where something was still going on, something weird and experimental was going on. If you take one thing away from this tonight... 
mm-hmm. go and watch Ultraviolet and come back and tell me how bloody brilliant you think it is because you will. Oh my god! It's oh well, I'm going to have to seek it out. That's oh please fantastic. do! It's yeah. amazing, um, really. And good. you're right. You know, there are in amongst all of these big mainstream uh, vampire stories, you have these little gems, right? You, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Guillermo del Toro's Chronos in the early yes. '90s, or yeah. you know, going through to the 21st century, movies like, of course, Let the Right One In, or yes. A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. Yes. These strange little sort of art house vampire yeah. films that are doing something different aren't they're they they're doing something well? different but they're also i think they're looking back to the 70s strand yes a, yes. a, a vampire film they're looking at the blood spattered bride and let's scare jessica to death they're not looking yeah. at interview with the vampire That's you know right. they're, they're looking to do something odd something weird something unusual and again you know they're, they're done they're allegories they're metaphors. They, you know, they, they, vampire has been a metaphor for everything from AIDS to corporate greed to all sorts mm-hmm. of things. And these films are using vampirism as metaphors for all kinds of social injustices. And, it, and you know, back into the mainstream, you know, as we speak, Morbius is on release, which is the latest <laughs> right. Marvel adaptation. And Morbius is the living vampire. Yeah. Now, they haven't gone anywhere. They've changed. Yeah. They've mutated. And sometimes they're mutated into something that I find really interesting, like A Girl Walks Home at Night and mm-hmm. Let the Right One In. Both versions, I have to say. I think both versions of Let the Right One In have, have huge merits to them. And, you know, we, I thought maybe that it was over when we got What We Do in the Shadows and it was spoofing them. And as I said, you know, he's going to kill them. But it was done so well and so, so affectionately that yes. it, it seems to have actually just made people want to do more vampire films because it's, That's right. you know, it, it was such a loving Send up. Okay. How was your night last night? I transformed into a dog and had sex. Cool. We're going to have a little flat meeting in the kitchen in about 15 minutes, okay? Okay. Okay. Shall I close this? Yes. That's it. It's it's loving, but it's hilarious, and and uh, you know th- that's it. Vampires now they belong in comedy, they belong in romance. There is also this other little subset of vampire films we've got recently, which is the action vampire movie, right? Whether it's yes. Blade yep. or the Night Watch, Day Watch movies, that's or Morbius. Right. You know these kind of almost superhero movies, I suppose. They are. They're superhero films, but with the superheroes or the terrorists turned into vampires, and you know, and it still works. They still work in these films. You know, there's um, there's some. Uh, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of Blade, but I did like the night day watch night watch films. I thought they were yeah. fantastically good fun. And yeah, yeah it, again, it's that malleability of the vampire, isn't it? It's it's they're still undead and well now, all these years later, and still sort of you know churning out vampire films left right and center you know so. and i think it's it's at that point as well where we all know vampires so well i mean one of the things we didn't really talk about was the the the, the rules right and i guess most of these were were, were from dracula bram yeah. stoker's dracula right this idea of like they don't cast a reflection in yeah, the mirror yeah. they don't like crucifixes garlic sometimes sure. they can turn into bats sometimes they can't, can't yeah. um, you know all of these different that they, they have to be invited in in order yes. to you know all of these yeah. different i think that gives storytellers lots of fun stuff to play with doesn't it as well oh know? yeah it does uh, and you harpy back to my beloved ultraviolet there's a wonderful little thread in it that the, the good guys can tell if the person they're looking at is a vampire because when they hold the gun which has got special bullets vampire killing bullets in it they've got mm. a video camera mounted on the top you can't yeah. see them in video cameras they don't uh-huh. show up on video so this is like this, this was the high tech equivalent so they don't show up in mirrors and that's yeah. what they do the rules get bent out of shape all the time but they kind of stay roughly in the right place but they just they manipulate the rules and they push at the boundaries a little bit and i know some fans don't like that but honestly guys give it a chance because i think you know this that's why the vampire is still with us is because those yes. rules got changed you know the the idea of them changing into a bat that came and went with all kinds of films you know not not even the um, universal films were entirely consistent on that score you know so that's right yeah yeah so it it, it just let people take what they want from it, do what they need to do, and then mm. we'll see how it plays out, you know? And if it doesn't play out, then fine, let's move on to the next one. Do you think we've lost the vampire from the horror genre, though? This is the thing, right? I mean, mm. even Let the Right One In is a kind of... It's got some scary moments, but yeah. it's a kind of sweet sort of friendship story yes, too, right? it is. Um, do, do you think we'll ever get classic scary horror movies again about vampires? I think so. I think, you know, it, it's on television, but we've seen Midnight Mass recently oh, you know which yeah. is you know what an excellent program that is and i think that took mm. a step back to 
bringing vampires back home again, as it were. Yes. And yes, of course they will. I think at some point, you know, every sort of, you know, Z-budget filmmaker will finally get sick of making zombie films and they'll make some vampire <laughs> films and suddenly Z vampires will be back. And it's yeah. only going to take, you know, one... It'll take Ari Aster or someone to make a vampire film and suddenly they'll be yes. cool again and they'll be scary again. Or, you know, if, you know, this talk about Robert Egger remaking... Oh, Nosferatu, yes. isn't there? Now, if he does that, that could be the return of it. You know, if he if he does that straight, and I'm sure he will because he's too canny a director not to, if he does that as a proper horror story, that could be the return of the vampire to horror. Yeah, yeah. And I why, think why, it's yeah. Def- why not? Why not? It should come home. Mm. It should come home. You know, it's where it belongs. They are meant to be scary. We've had the romantic ones. Yep, yeah, that's fine. That's great. I've no problem with them. Let them have that. But I want the scary ones back again. You know, yes. I, I, I want to be frightened by that thing lurking in the shadows, you know. I know, right? I think we're getting another Salem's Lot film at some point yes. as well, a yep. new adaptation of that, so yep. that's going to be interesting. And again, yeah. if, they, if they sort of do it close to the novel, yeah. which was very scary, you know, it let's was. hope, you know, don't camp it up, don't, don't do it tongue-in-cheek, play it straight, give us what we want, and, you know, it could bring vampires back, yeah. It's, gonna, you know, it's, it's like with every other character, isn't it? It takes one big hit, you know, folk horror was kind of moribund until Midsummer came along and sort of That's now right. every other bloody film is folk horror, you know. <laughs> oh, look, yeah. it's got a tree in it. It must be folk horror. Yeah, whatever. But, you know, I it, know. It, you know zombie true. films have sort of fallen by the wayside until 28 days later and Shaun of the Dead picked them up and gave them a boot and off we went. We were back with zombie films again. It takes that one film and who knows where that is. It might be just around the corner. There might be a film out there now that's being shot we don't know anything about that's going to... You know, That's restore right. the glory days with a vampire film. If they don't, we've got a hundred film, a hundred years of vampire films. Oh my god, so you know, many! <laughs> you are never, ever, ever going to see all the vampire films that have ever been made ever. Trust no, me. I've, no, I've tried. No. I'm sixty. I still haven't scratched the surface. You know, there's a <laughs> no, lot. There's a even, lot. Even Dracula, right? I mean, even even Dracula. Yeah, yeah I think it's yeah. Yeah, Kim Newman does on his social media. He does a daily Dracula, doesn't he? That's and right. It's like, yeah, you could post about a different Dracula adaptation every day of the year, and you you. you you know, yeah. it's, it's I, I thought I knew my Dracula, but obviously nobody knows Dracula like Kim does. And he'll put stuff up and I'm like, where the hell did he get that from? <laughs> <laughs> I know the guy knows his stuff, but bloody hell, Kim, where did you find that? I mean, it's incredible. So, yeah, I mean, Dracula is everywhere in popular culture. So here's a, here's a, 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 a little challenge for, you know, the, mm. the, more, the more nerdy fan out there. Dedicate your um, DVD and Blu-ray buying career from now on to just collecting Dracula films. You'll oh never get bored. Trust me. Yeah. You'll be broke, yeah. but you'll never yeah. get bored. <laughs> yeah, you'll never finish. You'll yeah. never finish. Un- no, exactly. Unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Um, well, there you go. What? Uh, how exciting. And yeah, it's a, it's a big intimidating amount of movies to get through um, across this series. I'm looking but- at your list and there are some beautiful films on this list actually i have to say i cannot wait to tune in for some of this lot you know even the ones i'm not sort of keen on i want to hear what people see in buffy the vampire slayer and twilight because i don't get it i want to know i want to understand that but you know i'm looking at some of the others that are on the list and i'm not going to give them away but Mm. Wow, there's some bloody classics on this list. There's some really some great incredible films. Incredible stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and to finish with the imp- impossible question that always makes you angry, Kev. <laughs> what's your What's your favourite vampire movie? Oh, God's sake! Every bloody time, Munster. <laughs> I don't wear favourite vampire film. Good God! I mean, today it's you know the Hammer Dracula from 1958. You know, tomorrow yeah. it'll be something else entirely. I think the Hammer Dracula will probably always be up there because for me, it's you know Christopher Lee for the first time, Peter Cushing, who's my favourite actor of oh, all time. Just, the, just you know love the, him. the definitive Van Helsing. Absolutely mm. marvellous film. But there are just so many of them. You know, let's scare Jessica to death. I'd probably put that in my top five. Mm-hmm. Films of all time, my top three vampire movies, top two vampire films. There you go. They have to. Yeah. Let's get Jessica to death and, and <laughs> the Hammer Dracula and come back. I mean, that's pretty good because they couldn't be more different from couldn't each be more other different. as well, exactly. right? Yeah. Come back to me yeah. tomorrow and I'll give you another two because I'll change my mind. But, you know, that's, that's the way it is. <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, there we go. Well, Kev, thank you so much. It's Always been, a as pleasure. As ever, such an absolute joy. Uh, and tell people where they can find, if they want to find more of Kevin Lyons' writing and, and other uh, commentaries and various other bits and pieces, where can they find you? I, I'm like a nasty 
rash on the internet. I'm everywhere and irritating people. <laughs> it's, I, I've got a, a review website, the EOFF TV Review. You can go look mm. that up and you find reviews go up almost every day. I've just passed 2,000 films, 2,000 reviews on there. So there's plenty to keep you occupied. Lots of vampire mm-hmm. films. Um, EOFFTV.com, that's my main site. If you look for EOFF TV on um, social media, you'll find me wittering on about nonsense somewhere. So <laughs> with, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find me around. I'm, I'm there. Just come and say hello. It's always always nice to meet new 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 people. You're you're omnipresent like Dracula. You're everywhere. You I know, I so. yeah. I'm am I'm, I'm a I'm a very fat bald Dracula to be fair. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Kev, thank you so much for joining me. No, thank you for inviting me. It's been great fun. A big thank you to the incredible Kevin Lyons. Uh, So before we crack on with the rest of our vampire introduction episode, I'm just going to take a quick moment to thank this week's sponsor. That's $20 Patreon subscriber Adam Wybray. Uh, Adam sent me a message with some details of an exciting project that might be of interest to listeners of this pod. Adam says, hello, Mike. Thank you for all the joy and comfort you and your guests have given me over the last few years. I started listening to the pod back in season two, the ghost season, and I'm so thankful that your excellent tastes finally pushed me in the direction of watching the MR James BBC adaptations and buying the excellent box set. Uh, With regards to my own projects, I wanted to let listeners know about a book proposal for an edited essay collection in the Hidden Horror Histories book series published by Liverpool University Press. Uh, I I would love to have some contributions from any academically inclined listeners of the podcast. My proposed title is Global Animated Horror. The collection would be on animated horror films and shows that go beyond the strictly Western, European or American or Japanese reach of previous research in this area. In keeping with the remit of hidden horror histories, Global Animated Horror would explore how practitioners use animation to explore questions of identity and intersectionality, deploying the transformative and material qualities of the medium to rework tropes and themes from the horror genre and associate subgenres. If you have an idea for a chapter you would like to write, please email a 300 to 500 word abstract to adamwybray at gmail.com. Finally, I have my own podcast, Still Scared, Talking Children's Horror, which I've co-hosted with Ren Wednesday since 2017. We're not nearly as prolific as EOH, but we've covered a wide range of spooky children's classics like Goosebumps, The Demon Headmaster, Round the Twist, and The Deptford Mice Books as well as more recent shows like uh, Over the Garden Wall and Creeped Out. You can find us by searching Still Scared on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Well, a big thank you uh, once again to Adam Wybray. uh, And that sounds like a really interesting project that you are working on here. And one more time, if any listeners out there are interested in global animated horror and fancy potentially contributing an essay to this collection, then email adamwybray at gmail.com. And I will list his email address and all the details of this in the show notes. One more time, a huge thank you to this week's sponsor, $20 Patreon subscriber, Adam Wybray. Uh, And if you want to join him, if you want to become an Evolution of Horror sponsor with your own little segment just like this, then sign up to our Patreon at a $20 level. Patreon.com slash Evolution of Horror. Hi, I'm Annie Hardy and you're watching Vancar. Another day in paradise. Hello? Listen, I just need you to take my friend somewhere nearby. This is Angela, her and I, taking a trip. (laughs) Did you find me? Hello? Hello? That was a little clip you just heard there from the new movie by Rob Savage, the director of Host. His follow-up, Dashcam, is finally getting a theatrical release. It's going to be out in the UK uh, nationwide on the 3rd of June. But for anyone who is in or within reach of London, we've got a very exciting opportunity happening a few days earlier. On the 1st of June, we are going to be hosting a very special preview screening of Dashcam at the Genesis Cinema 
in London. This is going to be part of the Evolution of Horror Presents strand. We've partnered with the Genesis Cinema and I, along with my friend of the pod, Becky Dark, are going to be hosting and organising monthly events, monthly screenings of cult films, horror films, classics and new movies. Uh, We hosted our first Evolution of Horror Presents screening a couple of weeks ago, David Lynch's Eraserhead. We had an amazing crowd of people there. Becky and I met a load of uh, listeners beforehand. We hosted drinks at the bar. We had David Lynch themed cocktails. uh, And then we screened the amazing Eraserhead on the big screen. It was really an incredible evening. So our next screening on the 1st of June is going to be a special preview of Dashcam. And not only that, we're going to be bringing you a little post-screening panel discussion that's going to work as a kind of live podcast. So we're going to be recording a live podcast on stage following the film. Uh, That is going to be at the Genesis Cinema. So if you want to get tickets, head on over to evolutionofhorror.com forward slash Genesis, which will take you to the uh, Genesis website where you can buy your tickets. And I cannot emphasize enough just how much fun Rob Savage's Dashcam is. It's a hilarious, terrifying, absolutely mad found footage horror film. And it's so worth watching it on the big screen with an audience. So if you can, get yourself down to the Genesis Cinema on the 1st of June and join me and a whole bunch of other friends of the pod to enjoy that movie on the big screen. Evolutionofhorror.com forward slash Genesis. Meanwhile, over on Patreon this week, we are going to be bringing you episode three of our brand new monthly strand, Fresh Blood, which is available for $5 donors and upwards. Fresh Blood is a brand new magazine style strand, uh, one episode at the beginning of each month in which me and my three co-hosts, Brad Hansen, Becky Dark and Louise Blaine, discuss, review and recommend everything new in the horror genre. We cover movies, TV, games, uh, physical releases, streaming streaming and horror news and announcements. It's a great place for everyone out there who's a horror fan to figure out exactly what they can watch each month on streaming services, what they can pick up on DVD or Blu-ray. As I know, it's a very difficult world to navigate right now. So uh, yeah, this week was episode three in which we discussed and reviewed a whole bunch of new releases from this month. Uh, We discussed Shudder new releases such as The Sadness, Netflix films such as Choose or Die, and we talked about a whole bunch of movies out in cinemas, including Brad's favourite, the Nick Cage movie, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, and I discussed one of the best movies I've seen in possibly the last few years, an epic new movie about the multiverse, no, not that one, the other one, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, which is truly spectacular so we review that and a whole bunch of other stuff on this week's fresh blood if you want to sign up then head on over to our patreon and get yourself subscribed patreon.com slash evolution of horror meanwhile there's loads of other really cool stuff going on on patreon if you sign up at a ten dollar level you'll get access to our exclusive bonus mini seasons we've got two seasons running at the same time right now Uh, a globe trotting horror mini season where every episode we take a different Uh, part of the world, a different country, a different region, and we take a look back at their history of horror. So far, we've done episodes on Australia and exploitation. we've done South Korean horror, we've done Nordic horror, and we've done Spanish horror. Uh, So that's been a really fun mini-series to do. Uh, And then meanwhile, we're also doing a Legends of Horror mini-season for $10 patrons, where each episode we take a different legend of the horror genre, whether that's a filmmaker, writer, actor. So we've done an episode on Vincent Price, uh, an episode on Wes Craven, and an episode on Stephen King. So if you want access to all of these mini seasons as well, then get involved at a $10 level. Patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Or you can sign up at $20 and get access to absolutely everything and become an evolution of horror sponsor like this week's sponsor, Adam Wybray. But no matter what tier you sign up to, you'll also get a little shout out on the main podcast as a thank you. Speaking of, I'm going to give the first bulk of people who signed up to our Patreon during our hiatus a very special thanks. So these are all the people that signed up in the month of January. A big thank you to Niall Clark, Sean Freeman, Travis Geldard, Peter Lee, Tressa Brill, Stephen McCartney, 
Barbecue Pit Dog, Andrew W. Vassamilla, Greg Kaufman, Jen Harrison, Philip Gwyn Jones, Maureen Steddin, Justin Tatora, Anna Mers, Ashley Smith, Ashwin Kurana, Billy McKenzie, Jerry Palano, Cara Henson, Charity Oxner, Joe Devine, Confused Optimist, T. Almond, Gareth Wilkinson, Jeff Weber, Steve Iversrud, Henry of Finland, Aidan Kirk, Peter Strain, Ryan Besh, Jana Crone, uh, Merman Helville, Aidan Flynn, Imi Gamester, Matthew Bolton, Dobro Dave, Jacob Pommelgaard, Bradery, and Stephen Wachowski. A big thank you to all of those people. And one more time, if you want to sign up to our Patreon and get a whole bunch of weekly bonus content and more, then sign up now. Patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Okay, as we hurtle into the second half of this week's episode, we've got another special guest joining us, another long-time friend of the pod. It wouldn't be a series of this podcast without the contributions from this brilliant person. Here to discuss her thoughts on the vampire subgenre, it's Freudian cinephile Mary Wilde. Hello, Mary. Hey, Mike. How are you? I am good. It's so good to have you back on. I was saying to Kevin Lyons earlier, it always feels like an exciting first day of a new school semester or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the best kind of school. Well, of course. I mean, for a nerd like me, this is all very exciting. (laughs) Um, Okay, so we are talking vampires this series, of course, and I've been dying to hear your take on this subgenre, Mary. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with it. Are you a fan of vampire movies? Oh, yeah. I am a super fan of vampires. I love the aesthetic. I love just everything about what it symbolizes. This has actually been a topic that I've been pretty like hotly anticipating since you started your podcast. Mm, mm -hmm. So it's very exciting to get stuck into it now. I love it. Well, I mean, the vampire as a, as a creature, there, there must be so much good psychoanalytic Freudian kind of subtext and ground to explore, right? (laughs) With this kind of subgenre. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, at the top of my list, I would have to say um, the the kind of intrigue of vampires psychoanalytically would have to be the sex appeal and sexuality that they exude. Yes. I mean, when you released your trailer for this series, I thought it was the sexiest <laughs> trailer. I, I know. Would you know what? I was trying to, whenever I make those trailers, mm. I always try and capture what the kind of essence of a particular <laughs> subgenre is, right? And when I did a zombies one and made it really gross and gory and there were mm. lots of kind of, you know, blood splats and all of that kind of thing and beheadings. And, and uh, when I did the kind of mind and body one, it was a lot of kind of existential looking kind of stuff. And I thought, what is the kind of key to the vampire, the mood of the vampire? It is sexy, right? Yeah. I mean, like, they've got to be the sexiest monsters in horror, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. The most fanciable ones, for sure. Yes, yes. And because um, of that, I suppose that's what truly makes them psychoanalytic, because the heart of psychoanalytic theory is, uh, you know, the libido, the sex drive, uh, eroticism. Uh, here, of course, it takes a dark turn because they're also killers and there's something deeply disturbed about them. So it's not like it's not like a purely like romantic element. It's, there is a destruction at the core of it as well. But mm. that would I would say that's the number one reason why it, vampires are so psychoanalytic because they're they're sex, you know, they're sex symbols. <laughs> yes. And do you think that's the key to the popularity of vampire movies as well? I mean, I think I would say they've probably been one of the most commercially successful sort of horror subgenres from the 30s all the way through to now, really, in a way. I do think so. I think that they bring a sort of glamour to horror yeah. in a very unique way. And I mean interestingly they also have this supernatural power of glamorizing their targets their victims Mm. like sort of like luring them telepathically in a very seductive way to kind of attract them so that they can drain their blood and so this glamour power also um, ignites them with this kind of glamorous uh, element which also seduces the audience so yes I do think that there's something there that you know I guess sort of like um, taps into the desire of looking in a cinema spectator. And so that's, I think that's part of a key really to their enduring power as a cinematic object. 
Totally. People can be repelled by vampires, but they could also be attracted to them, right? They can be allured by them. And uh, mm-hmm. there are some really interesting stories to tell with that kind of thing. Like, you don't get many people that want to, you know, that are turned on by being attacked by a zombie. But you get a lot of people out there that would like to be bitten by a vampire, yeah. right? Vampire groupies. And that's a really interesting area to explore. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it's like... There's something about them that I guess they present something that we really want unconsciously, which is, you know, the desire for eternal youth and beauty, you know, this Mm. ability. They're sort of like the fountain of youth, right? Um, Yes. uh, Wanting to remain young and beautiful till the end of time. The fact that um, they've also lived a very long time due to being undead. So they've been able to witness a vast stretch of history firsthand and benefit from that corresponding knowledge. So there's so many reasons why they, they, they sort of possess a lot of the things that we would want to have to have an advantage over mere mortals. So I can totally understand, you know, the vampire groupie like world <laughs> you know, uh, wanting to be bitten. Totally. Yeah, th- there's something freeing about it, too, I think, isn't there? I think that's what makes it so enticing this idea that you could live by your own rules you know you're still part of society if you want to be but you kind of live outside of society's rules you can be as sexually free as you want to be you know on all of those other kind of classic christian norms you kind of reject them all and live your own way and there's something again very exciting about that yes definitely they're very rebellious creatures who have their own kind of path in life they're sort of anarchists you know they're total other, you know there's total like gutter snipes in the streets and there's something very appealing about that witnessing these creatures that obey only their own rules um mm. but at the same time i would say that you know maybe they're like that because on some level they have been othered you know um there's there's something about the vampire especially if you look at it historically how it sort of emerged through literature and then film where there is associated with vampires this kind of fear of foreigners and xenophobia yes this idea of like the uncivilized immigrant from the east coming to violate and corrupt western women and so in a way they've had they've been pushed into that otherness and into this rebellious streak and lifestyle uh, because they were never fully accepted and unable really to integrate that's such a good point and what about this emphasis on blood for vampires then? Because again, mm. obviously, there's something instinctively wrong, I suppose, for us uh, with the idea of, you know, blood, this this liquid that belongs, you know, on the inside of our body being drunk, being consumed by somebody that actually looks human, you know? And I think there yeah. is something uncanny and creepy about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they're so associated with also contagious blood diseases, you know, like syphilis and the spread of venereal disease. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's sort of, I suppose, a good symbol of like a warning symbol against what can happen if you give up your purity, you know, like there's this kind of like wretched creature um, aiming to drain you of your life force, your blood, Um, you know, it could also be a stand-in for out of wedlock sex being perceived yes. as dirty and dangerous and bad. So almost like a walking poster boy for STDs or something, you know, That's like true. STIs. Yeah. yeah, there is a kind of hint of that even in Dracula with the character of Lucy, I think, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. definitely there. And I suppose it's not it's not particularly subtle metaphor, but that idea of kind of exchanging of fluids, right, yes. is all very much there in vampirism. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's just completely covered in themes of lust and seduction and especially, <clears throat> especially draining humans of their fluids and with that oral gratification i mean it's very (laughs) (laughs) nice but it's true yeah that's that's all there very much on the surface i think with vampires isn't it um and what are what are your thoughts on the way vampires have kind of changed in popular culture i mean like Mm. if you go back to one of the earliest vampire movies nosferatu where Mm. you know it's it's a truly kind of monstrous looking vampire and you compare that to what we get in the 21st century like you know, twinkling Robert Pattinson in Twilight, right? And you look at the way in which 
you know, what are your thoughts on the way in which vampires have kind of changed over the years? Yeah, the evolution of vampires for sure seems to hinge on the heightened uh, sexuality and I suppose like less of the decaying dimension and much more of the kind of just very horny, very, (laughs) very glamorous and very like tantalizing element of what awaits you if you let yourself get seduced by a vampire, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the danger level remains the same. They're they're still like killers and uh, they'll destroy you, you know? And actually they're very honest about that. I don't think they ever, um, they, they don't really kind of sell a different dream, I think. They... What's yeah. also interesting about them is that they have to get permission to come into your house. You know? <laughs> I know. I love that. <laughs> I mean, you know. They're all about consent. They're all about <laughs> consent, right? Like, <laughs> like, I like this kind of brutal honesty with them. So that kind of remains the same. But what does change, I think, is they move from just being quite grotesque and frankly, like, ugly creatures to mm-hmm. to actually, like, powerfully seductive like irresistible creatures that still will destroy you but but maybe along the way you might have a much better time (laughs) (laughs) exactly right exactly that yeah i think around the sort of 90s vampires really went sort of super romantic you know with Anne rice and Mm. interview with the vampire and and even things like buffy and then true blood and then of course twilight as well you know it kind of yeah almost like it doesn't doesn't even just belong in the horror genre anymore the vampire does it it almost kind of it, it sort of transcends that it, 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 you know i feel like there is there's vampire stories for kids there's vampire stories for romances you know there's a kind of vampires for for everyone now yeah there's a vampire on sesame street count dracula yes i love the count <laughs> yeah exactly yeah exactly you know so uh, they're, they're sort of a little bit more mainstream i suppose than many other horror uh, subgenre characters that we might think of. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think Sesame Street are going to invite, uh, I don't know, like serial killers on there anytime <laughs> soon, you know? Yeah. Um, like Leatherface is not going to have a guest cameo on Sesame Street. But at the same time, um, I think maybe there is something much more like existentially relatable with yes. vampires. Like now I'm thinking of like Tom Hiddleston's character in Only Lovers Left Alive. Yes. Like he is so, um, he's sort of like a depressive, he, you know, it's like it's like he's a depressive and that is a stand in for the vampire structure, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's a really interesting film as well in that regard, because, you know, I guess it's, it, there's so many different ways you can tell stories about vampires. And that yeah. one is almost a bit like, the mundanity of being a vampire yes. right it's like what happens if you do live forever what would that be like would you get bored you know like there is mm. an element of that to some of these stories as well and that's really interesting and i guess that's it we're so far into vampire mythology now you know anyone of any age of any generation will know what a vampire is and the rules of the vampire so you almost don't need to worry about that and then you can just tell whatever story you want to tell in a way oh that's so true you're, you're right and you, and there is something to be said as you said about the kind of mundane element of, you know, I guess having to bear the burden of living forever and every day almost becomes like a Groundhog's Day, you know, existence. This repetition Mm -hmm. of what was once so exciting has now become kind of like ordinary, really. Um, And but but, but with that, it's so interesting. And so it's such a mixed archetype because as you said, it also presents with things that we really want as, you know, mortal human beings, like all of these heightened senses, you know, the ability to fly, shape shift, Mm -hmm. uh, like I mentioned, glamorize victims, seductively lure them telepathically. Um, So in a way, it also has this dimension of like super superhero archetypes yes it does yeah right? yeah yeah well we've got jared leto and morbius this year yeah. right <laughs> we've got we've got literally a uh right. a, a vampire superhero or super villain or whatever he's supposed to be i don't know but yeah that, that it's true we that's another subset of the vampires is mm. there's the kind of action hero vampire there's blade blade and, yeah yeah and and i guess you know some of the characters in buffy kind of be- became that as well and yeah there's that's just another Another kind of interesting facet of it as well isn't it yeah really yeah yeah there's, yeah. So, there's something for everyone 
There really is. There really is. And speaking of, I'm going to quickly, uh, I want to ask you your thoughts on just some of these kind of key vampire movies and, and eras and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, we are spending the first few weeks of this series purely looking at Dracula because, of course, it's it's insane the amount of Dracula adaptations. Uh, I think it's been adapted more than any other story. I think that character has appeared in more movies and mm. TV shows than any other character in history, even more than Sherlock Holmes, which used to kind of have the record for that. Um, um, what is it, in your opinion, about Dracula as a as a character, as a persona, as a story that just seems to keep inspiring people over and over again? Oh, well, I mean, I think it's um, he's just sort of covered in so much mystery. You know, he's yeah. sort of an unknowable figure mm-hmm. and he leaves. There's so much um, gap about, um, I suppose, like his storyline it is very much shrouded in the unknown. And because Mm -hmm. of that, I think it activates so much of the imagination of spectators and readers. Mm. Um, It's so mystifying and like beguiling and intriguing when we're faced with someone who poses that level of danger and is also kind of weirdly seductive in a way that we wouldn't expect. He's sort of like, destroys a lot of conventional tropes about what it is to become en- enamored with a, with a character in a story. Yes. Um, and so it is, he really is a kind of, um, I guess like a real trailblazer in this, in the sort of uh, way that we would think of in terms of like hero or anti-hero. So um, I guess for that reason, because he's so mysterious, it, it sort of invites a great many um, kind of attempts at reinterpreting him, reimagining him. And then he becomes this figure of influence over like the vampire trope itself. So incredibly influential. So um, influential. Yeah. And even that, even that performance by Bella Lugosi, right? Oh my uh, God. It's like, is there a more influential performance ever? You know, because you, you oh. think of basically every portrayal of a vampire ever since, even like you say, the Count from Sesame Street. They all <laughs> they all do Bella Lugosi, don't they? It's unbelievable. Yes, they do. Exactly. Uh, I yes. mean, it's incredible that the impact that he had, for sure. Yeah. It's such a cinematic, you know, um, treasure, really. Um, we're going to be covering, you know, everything from Bella Lugosi to Christopher Lee, all the way through mm. to Gary Oldman. Uh, do you have a particular favourite Dracula movie or Dracula performance? Ooh, uh, I think it would have to be Christopher Lee. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. He, he's just got so much kind of gravitas, doesn't he, I think? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's so watchable and so charismatic. Mm-hmm. And t- I find him truly scary as as Dracula. <laughs> yes, one of the most scary Draculas, isn't he? Yeah. Definitely. I think it's, it's Christopher Lee. He's so imposing and <laughs> quiet and menacing, isn't he? I think, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's an incredible performance. Let me ask you briefly about one of the one of the interesting texts that I'm not sure we're going to have time to actually explore in depth this series, but I wanted to ask you about it because I know you're a fan, Mary, is the American TV show Dark Shadows, mm-hmm. right, which initially ran through the 60s and 70s. And it was a kind of soap opera, wasn't it, about vampires. And actually, this was a real turning point, I think, in vampires becoming extremely mainstream, becoming a little bit more widely known, reaching an audience outside of the horror genre. Um, You're a fan of Dark Shadows, aren't you, Mary? I am, yeah. I love Dark Shadows so much, specifically the one that ran in the early 90s. I I believe it was 1990, 1991. Ah, okay, yeah. So, So that's the TV show show that I watched when I myself was like a youngster, you know, and right. um, I became obsessed with it. It is so stylish. Um, and it's all about this vampire called Barnabas Collins, who, uh, you know, um, had, um, has come to America from England and mm-hmm. uh, is kind of revived from his tomb 200 years after his death. And he's a vampire. Um, mm. And I highly recommend everyone actually seek out this bit particular one i mean i can't really vouch for the earlier soap i think that's a little bit more camp um right but the one from the 90s has got just the most incredible cinematography it doesn't feel like you're watching a tv show it seems like you're watching an extended film oh wow it is so luscious and beautiful the, all the characters are incredibly attractive and cinegenic <laughs> and the way that barnabas seduces is i mean it's pretty hot <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, amazing. Oh, I'm going to have to check this out. And actually, you've lent me the, well, you've given yes. me the DVD set of this, haven't you? Yeah. So I really must, I must sit down and watch it when I have time because I've heard so much good stuff about this TV show. And I think I was initially put off by the, the Tim Burton, Johnny oh, Depp God. film, which I didn't like. You know? Yeah, that's a travesty. That's, that, <laughs> I can't believe that was ever signed off. It's terrible. I know. Yeah, for sure. The 1990s one is truly spectacular. I, I would love to know your thoughts on it. Oh, I'm going to, uh, yeah, as soon as I get time, <laughs> I'm popping that on. Can't wait. Great. Um, and then briefly, I just want to ask you about the 70s uh, in vampire cinema as well. Mm. You know, everything got a little bit sexier, a bit more erotic, a bit more <laughs> artistic and experimental as well. Daughters of Darkness, Let's Scare Jessica to Death, you know, The Blood Spattered Bride. There's some really interesting, weird little gems in the 70s. Yeah, and I think that it is really telling and revealing that it would also go into kind of the realm of queer cinema with lesbianism yes. portrayed within this kind of vampire world. Because I think that the vampire is a kind of, um, let's say compared to a heteronormative sexuality, he is sort of queer, you know, like he is something yeah. of um, an outlier sexually. So actually that makes him, um, I suppose, very comfortable um, as an as an ideal or a symbol that can then be transferred onto, um, let's say, uh, homosexuality, um, yeah. uh, which I think is also deeply, you know, um, I suppose, yeah, like deeply explored in, let's say, inter interview with the vampire where there's so much hom homoeroticism. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It's so linked, isn't it? Vampire, mm -hmm. also the sexiest subgenre, also probably the gayest subgenre. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love it. That's why we love it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, it's so true. Um, and then as we move into the 80s, we get this kind of really interesting era that becomes a little bit, vampires become cooler. You know, mm. suddenly it becomes teenage vampires, vampire gangs, where you've got the Lost Boys, yeah. you've got The Hunger with David Bowie and oh. Susan Sarandon. And, you know, you've got obviously, like we say, into the 90s interview with the vampire, you've got Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise, you know, that's a kind of really interesting era there, isn't it? Where suddenly vampires become not just sexy, but also incredibly cool, right? Oh, Almost yeah. like posters, uh, you know, that teenagers would want on their walls and that kind of thing. 100%. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Like just, I, I, I suppose it might be also linked to the compulsion to kind of imagine what they would wear, you know, like yeah. their fashion and how they're so like, they're so like detached and, mm -hmm. and kind of um, so not interested in the mainstream and what everybody else is doing. They're off doing their own thing and that makes them instantly cool and yeah. instantly like cutting edge and with this kind of great danger associated with them. So it's no wonder that uh, we see those films in the 80s, the ones that you mentioned. I'm now, you know, I'm thinking of also like the addiction as well, you know, yes. um, where there is that kind of like black and white kind of feel to it. Very almost that almost neo-noir in a way you know mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah and and I suppose yeah always carrying with it the element of danger I think that's kind of um it's, uh, it's one that is something that's really vital about them very cool isn't it and then mm. let me I've got to ask you Mary what are your thoughts on the Twilight <laughs> movies have you seen the Twilight <laughs> movies are you a fan I have seen them and uh -huh. I am a fan definitely uh, amazing I love it yeah I think a lot of people are secretly fans even <laughs> when they don't want to admit it you know um, I'm actually quite looking forward to discussing the Twilight movies because I think there's a lot of that's going to be interesting about them, you know? Yeah, for sure. You know, I think that it's um, always fascinating when you have this kind of like a pop culture sensation um, with young people becoming totally obsessed, you know, mm -hmm. with a story like this, um, of course, is tapping into kind of that like sexual awakening that teenagers go through and everything. But to kind of have it all predicated on the vampire trope, I think is really interesting, you know, um, it says something about the preoccupations of modern young people, you know, mm -hmm. that they have to consider sexuality 
very much intermixed with this element of danger. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it speaks volumes about like the kind of unspoken fears and obsessions of people from that generation. And yeah, I'm, I mean, you know, I'm a huge Robert Pattinson fan, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind telling you. Um, obviously, in ba- probably back in the day when he was just known as Edward in Twilight, it might have not been so cool to admit that, but um, he's gone to prove, you know, his acting, you know, credentials. There's no oh doubt God. anymore. Um, yeah. I mean, I, once you've worked with like Cronenberg oh my and gosh. Robert Eggers, right? It's like he's exactly. now he's now one of the coolest actors out there, isn't he? Oh, yeah. sure. Absolutely. And he's the Batman. So, you know. So, and he's the Batman. And also <laughs> Kristen Stewart, too, actually. You know, like yes. it's really interesting that, yeah, I, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people kind of really turned their nose up at these yeah. two actors. And look at what an amazing career they've both gone on to have since My those gosh. movies as well. Yeah, incredible. They're bona fide film stars, A-listers with yeah. great talent, you know. They're both incredibly cinegenic and, tr- you know, wonderful character actors. I mean, it's really rare to get both in, in the same performer and they're both equally incredibly talented. So, yeah, I look back on those movies as like kind of a bit of their time. Um, yeah. And, and probably the franchise, you know, some some of the films leave a little to be desired i'm not gonna lie like (laughs) it is a bit cheesy sometimes but i think there's just some great lines there's some great like bangers in there like when when you know like the line about um edward being like heroin or so or 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 he does he say to bella that she's his heroine (laughs) yeah (laughs) oh the dialogue is amazing i can't wait to revisit them it's gonna be hilarious yeah Um, for sure (laughs) <laughs> uh, and then during the 21st century, we've had, you know, I think post Twilight, you know, vampires have kind of gone that way. But there have been these other little, I guess, more kind of you could call them sort of art house sort of gems, I suppose. These kind mm. of slightly more indie movies, whether it's Let the Right One In or A Girl Walks mm. Home Alone at Night or, as we've mentioned, Only Lovers Left Alive. Right. There are these kind of really interesting little indie projects that kind of still exist just outside of the mainstream when it comes to vampires right which are really interesting yeah yeah incredible um once again proving just how versatile this um i suppose trope in horror is that it can be like kind of epic and ott and camp but Mm -hmm. also actually whittled down to a much more subtle size and able to communicate something a bit more kind of like I don't know, just something quieter and and maybe philosophically much more charged, which mm. we see in these other films where it's something um, really, really, um, I suppose, yeah, like really profound, but in an unexpected way. Yes. I, I, I really hope, I mean, what do you think is the future of vampire movies? I mean, there, mm. sa- there was sad news that broke just this week, actually, that Karen Kasama was supposed to be directing a Dracula movie and now it's been axed, right? And Which Ugh. is really sad. And, you know, I, I really hope that we can go back to having, you know, scary vampire horror movies again. Do you think that that, you know, that are we are we likely to see more you know scary traditional horror movies with vampires anymore yeah for sure i mean first of all like just to comment on the karen kasama news um mm. uh that drove a stake through my cold heart mike oh <laughs> I, I know i mean like she's she's <laughs> at, she's what like for so many of us she's a fave isn't she that's oh, the for thing sure. and you just know she'd do it really well definitely i mean she would have brought the kind of camp energy of jennifer's body and the quiet subtlety of the invitation to the vampire. I mean, yes, it, it, it's absolutely devastating. But yes, I do think that kind of imagining what could come next, um, I would love to see somebody like maybe Austin Butler in, mm. in a kind of very very like lush exquisite romantic and very dark and scary vampire movie but very sexy like but you know like almost like seductively dark um not too camp and i think he has what it takes he's got the looks you know he's very he's got those kind of wonderful features and i don't know it's maybe somebody like him or um maybe something like uh I would love to see some, maybe like an animated, like really dark vampire movie. Mm, Um, You know, like maybe just a a kind of mechanism of cinema that would 
introduce something different, you know, add a new layer to what we've seen before. Yeah, I would love that. Austin Butler, he's the guy that's playing um, Elvis, Elvis in the new Baz Luhrmann, isn't he? Yeah. Yes, he is. Really excited for that. <laughs> I know, it looks amazing. <laughs> looks amazing. Um, well, how exciting, Mary. And as as ever, you're going to be joining us and um, bringing us some little Wild About Horror segments about some of these movies, this series, which really yeah. excited to have you back on board to do that. And let me ask you, is there anything in particular, what are some of the movies that you're mm. kind of most looking forward to diving deep into and exploring this series well uh, definitely the lost boys that's like my number one <laughs> amazing are you a fan of the lost boys oh yeah super fan like definitely love the music everything oh, yeah um but also i would say um like the addiction which i mentioned mm-hmm. uh, i will be touching on a girl walks home alone at night love um it. and I think, yeah, I think like Blade for sure. And, and, and of course, Bram, Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> that movie celebrating its 30th anniversary this, this year. year. Yeah. Yeah. What an ins- I revisited it this week, actually. And it's, I, I feel like I like it more and more every time I rewatch it. You know, it's absolutely. <laughs> insane but i i love it it never it's never dull you know there's not a single dull dull moment (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly it's sort of like weirdly like bewitching isn't it (laughs) i know and i'm really excited to hear your take on let's scare jessica to death as well because that's a really interesting kind of psychological vampire movie isn't it yeah it really is Yeah. yeah Yeah, one of the gems for sure. Amazing. Well, I can't wait, Mary. I can't wait to get stuck in. Um, so uh, thank you so much for for joining me for this little chat. And um, we will be, you know, we'll hear you again very soon on the podcast. But in the meantime, mm-hmm. uh, let us know if there's anything you want to plug or if there's anywhere you, uh, where listeners can find more of your work. Well, yes, thank you as well as ever. An absolute pleasure to talk to you. And thank you for having me back. Of you can find me at uh, Psychstar, P-S-Y-C. C-S-T-A-R on Twitter and Instagram, where I announce my lectures and other projects. You can still find me as a co-host of Projections Podcast with Sarah Cleaver, and also join my Patreon, patreon.com slash Mary Wild. Amazing. Mary, thank you so much for joining me. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Mike. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to this week's brilliant guests, Kevin Lyons and Mary Wilde. Ah, it's good to be back. Uh, So excited for the next few months because we've got so many incredible films to cover. Uh, What movies are you most looking forward to hearing discussed? Please do get in touch. You can email us evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on all the socials. And if you follow us on Letterboxd, that's letterboxd.com slash evolutionpod you can find a gradually updating list of each movie we're going to be covering here on the podcast. There are also various spaces where you can talk to and meet fellow listeners. There's the discussion group, that's the Evolution of Horror discussion group, which you can find on Facebook. And we now also have a Discord channel. If you're a Discord user, then come find us there, the Evolution of Horror. Uh, You can find this podcast in all the normal podcast places. And if you get a chance, I'd be so, so grateful if you could spare a moment to drop us a rating and review on apple Podcasts. this is super important in helping us get discovered by new listeners okay onwards to next week then next week is going to be something that we've never really done before next week we are not going to be discussing any films instead we're going to be discussing a book Next week is going to be the first week in our run of episodes focusing purely on Dracula. And I've got two incredible guests joining me for this. In the first half of the episode, I'm going to be joined by the man who is pretty much the number one authority in the world on all things Dracula. The legend that is Kim Newman will be back on the podcast to discuss Dracula, the history of the character and the legacy. Then in the second half of the episode, I'm going to be joined by writer, actor, director and host of the Ghost Story Book Club podcast, Adam Robinson to discuss Bram Stoker's original novel, Dracula from 1897 in depth. So no films to discuss in depth next week, just an overview and an introduction to the world of Dracula. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. Horror.